Hello, everybody. What's up? Welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz, and uh, we're going to talk about some murder. Um, yeah. If you like murder, if you like hearing about true crime, all of the above. Mainly, this is a true crime channel, but I talk about murder a lot. If you like all of the above, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and turn that bell notification on. Oh, that way you know whenever I upload. Today's true crime case, we are going to be talking about Leonardo Cianquilli. I think that's how you say your last name. This is a case from Italy. Also, she is also known as the soap maker of Correggio, which when I found this case, I was like, man, that's my cousin's last name, Correggio. But that just means that her husband's really Italian. Anyway, so this case is uh, a very interesting one. Um, yeah, kind of teeter into cannibalism. A little bit, a little bit. I hope you're caffeinated and uh, get ready for this lovely ride. <clears throat> so, Leonardo. Leonardo. She was born on the 18th of April in 1894 in Montella, Avellino, Italy. Yes. <clears throat> so, she, when she was a young girl, she tried to commit suicide twice. So, she was not a happy person in general. In 1917, she married a registry office clerk. Um, his name is Raphael Pensardi. Her mother did not approve of this marriage whatsoever because her mother already had her pre-planned to marry another man. Now, Leonardo claimed that her mother had cursed them because of her not agreeing with what her mom wanted for her. Now, in 1921, the couple moved to her husband's hometown of Loria Potenza, um, and this is where she would ultimately be sentenced for fraud and imprisoned in 1927. Um, so when she was released, the couple then moved to Lacedonia, um, and it's here that in 1930, their home would be destroyed by the Urpinia earthquake that basically devastated the area and that this is when she moved they moved to Correggio and this is also where she opened a small shop she was very popular and she was very well respected in their neighborhood now Leonardo and her husband endured 17 pregnancies during their marriage um and lost three of their children to miscarriage. Ten more of their kids died during their youth. Um, and she was very protective of the four surviving children that they had. Extremely protective. Her fears of losing her kids were very, like, fueled by a warning that she received by a fortune teller sometime earlier in her life. And this person said that she would marry and have children, but all of the children would die young. And it's reported that Leonardo would visit a Romani, um, like a gypsy, basically, who practiced palm reading. And this person told her that in your right hand, I see prison. In your left hand, I see a criminal asylum. So she overall didn't have a, a good reading whatsoever. So in 1939, this is when Leonardo learned that her eldest son and her favorite child, Giuseppe, was jo going to join the Italian army in preparation for World War II. And she was absolutely determined to protect him at all costs and came to the conclusion that his safety required human sacrifices, apparently. And this is what starts the process of her murders. And all three of her victims were middle-aged women. And all of them were neighbors. Not very smart of this lady. So our first victim is Faustina Setti. Um, she was a lifelong spinster. And she had come to Leonardo to get help in finding a husband. Now, Leonardo told her that a super suitable partner was actually in Pola. And asked her to tell nobody of this. Now, she also persuaded Faustina to write letters and postcards to relatives and friends. These were mailed when she searched Pola and to tell them that everything was absolutely fine. Don't worry about anything. Now, when Faustina prepared for her, like, leaving, um, 
she then went back to Leonardo to visit her one last time. And this is when Leonardo killed her with an axe and dragged her body into a closet. It is then when she took said axe and cut Faustina into nine parts, gathered all of the blood into a basin. And <clears throat> Leonardo then would explain in detail in her official statement when she's arrested as to what happened. And <clears throat> this is part of her statement. She threw the pieces into a pot, added seven kilos of caustic soda, which she bought to make soap. She then stirred the mixture in until the pieces dissolved into a thick, dark mush. Then she poured several buckets and emptied into a nearby septic tank. As for the blood in the basin, she waited until it was coagulated, so when it started to thicken, it dried it in the oven, ground it, mixed it with flour, sugar, chocolate, milk, and eggs, as well as a little bit of margarine, and kneaded all the ingredients together. And She made lots of crunchy tea cakes with it and served them to ladies that came to visit. <sighs> Even though Giuseppe, which is her favorite son and her, ate them the most. Yeah, so she, uh, they ate the blood of Faustina. Now, it's reported that Leonardo has been receiving or received Faustina's life savings, which was about 30,000 lire for payment for her services. <clears throat> so, next one. Francesca Salvi. She's our second victim. Now, she... Leonardo claimed that Francesca found her a job, well, claimed that she found a job for Francesca at a school for girls in Piacenza. And like Faustina, Francesca was persuaded to write postcards and to and letters to friends, this time from Correggio and detailing her plans about like what's happening. Now, also like Faustina, Francesca came to visit Leonardo before she left. She was then drugged with wine and then killed with an axe. This murder happened on the 5th of September of 1940. Uh, Francesca's body was given the same treatment as, as Faustina's, and Leonardo was said to have obtained 3,000 lire from her. Our third is Virginia Cachapo. Yeah, Cachapo. This is the third and final victim. She was a widow. Now, she was also a former soprano, that sang at the La Scala, which is a, a theater, a very popular theater. <clears throat> now, for Virginia, she, Leonardo claimed to have found work for Virginia as a secretary at a mysterious in, um, impresario. Now, impresario is for, like, a person that organizes and finances concerts and stuff like that. So she said that she found a job for Virginia doing this in Florence. As with two other women, she, as with the other two women, sorry, Virginia was instructed to not tell a single person where she was going. And Virginia agreed, and on the 30th of September of 1940, she came to visit Leonardo for, right before she left. And the powder of, mur of murder was the same as the first two. However, unlike the first two, Leonardo turned Virginia into soap. So she said that Virginia ended up in a pot like the other two. Her flesh was fat and white. And when, she, when it melted, she added a bottle of cologne. And after a long time on the boil, she was able to make an acceptable creamy soap. She then gave bars to neighbors and acquaintances. And also she made cakes from her body as well. And she said that they tasted better and the woman was really sweet. From Virginia's murder, Leonardo received 50,000 lire in public bonds. She even sold the clothing and shoes of her victims as well. Now... Virginia's sister, Albertina Fonti, she was very suspicious as to why she disappeared, and she last saw her entering Leonardo's house. She feared that something had happened, and she reported these fears to the superintendent of police in Reggio Emilia, which is the like the bigger area of these little villages. Um, and he, this person then 
opened an investigation, and then Leonardo was arrested. Leonardo did not confess to the murders until they believed that her son, Giuseppe Pensardi, was involved in the crime, and this is when she confessed. She gave detailed accounts as to what happened, and she made sure to do that so that her son wouldn't get any of the blame. Now, she was tried for murder in 1946, and basically she she took the stand in her own trial, and this is when she gave a very odd deposition, and in this, she said, I gave the copper ladle, which I used to skim the fat off the kettles to my country, which was so badly in need of metal during the last days of war. She was found guilty of her crimes and sentenced to 30 years in prison and three years in a criminal asylum. Yeah, so she um, she's, a, she's a lovely lady. Um, so unfortunately, or fortunately for some people, Leonardo died. She died in the women's criminal asylum in Pozzuoli, 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 yeah, in 1970. She died from cerebral apoplexy, which basically that's a cerebral hemorrhage. Um, if you ever see that on like an older, like death certificate, it's basically it's an ICH, which it's an intracerebral hemorrhage or a cerebral bleed. And, um, or in other cases it's a hemorrhagic stroke and basically there's a, a bleed in the brain that can't stop and you will die. Um, she, but yeah, that happened on the 15th of October of 1970. Now, there's a lot of artifacts in this case, including the pot of which the victims are boiled, that are on display at the Criminological Museum in Rome. There's also a dark comic play made of, about this, which is called Love and Magic in Mama's Kitchen, and that came out in 1979. And this play began a run on Broadway in 1983. Um, but yeah, that, my friends, is the soap maker of Correggio. I know it's a really weird case, but I, I, I felt that it was, like, really good to add because it talks about human sacrifice, and a lot of these satanic panic crimes talk about human sacrifice. And I kind of wanted to add a little, like, boop, out of nowhere case, especially that the time frame where this happened around World War II, so... It's kind of like a prequel to the full hysteria of Satanic Panic. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. I will see you guys in another video. Bye, guys.